Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for your kind words. And I know, as you said, it gets easy, but I think, Sister Renal, I think when you sung that song, I think you really hit me. Because <laughs> God, our God is an awesome God. And I don't take this for granted because I know as we bring God's word, um, it's a heavy weight. So I even thank you for that song um, to remind me how awesome God is and what he's done for me and in my life and where he's brought me from. So thank you. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for another time, another season, Lord God, that we can be, Lord God, amongst your people to share your word. Lord, I pray that you will hide me behind your cross. Give me boldness, oh God. Take every bit of worry, oh God, away from me. Lord God, let it be less of me and more of you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord, as you speak. Lord, we thank you, oh God, for this word. I pray, oh God, that it will encourage, Lord God, that it will do what your word is meant to do, oh God. And we know whatever it's meant to do, Lord God, we know that it's perfect. So we thank you for it. We thank you for every ear that listens, oh God, over the airways, through social media. Lord God, I just pray, oh God, that it will be a blessing to someone. Lord God, we thank you because your word is already blessed. This we ask and this we pray in no other name, but it's in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I thank you, Pastor. For, thank you for another opportunity that you've given me uh, to share God's word. I want to first give honor to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, who is the head of my life, uh, to our covering Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough, again to our pastor, Reverend Dr. Maria A. Seaman, uh, a wonderful leader uh, at Shekinah Worship Center, Remember old uh, executive, uh, elders, uh, deacon board, my fellow deacons, God bless you. Uh, to my family and to my friends, all those who are tuning in, uh, rather be in the Zoom room or by social media, God bless you. Well, tonight, the topic that I'm going to speak on is don't be scared, be stirred. Don't be scared, be stirred. Now tonight, you heard the, the reading by our sister Dallas in your hearing, which was 2 Timothy 1, 3 to 9. Here, the apostle Paul wrote this letter while in prison, while he was in room nearer to the end of his journey of life. This letter was said to be have written in about the AD 66 or 67 from study. In chapter 28 in the book of Acts, we find Paul had been put in prison. And now once again, we find him here a second time in prison again in the book of Timothy. In our text, Paul writes a second letter to his son in the gospel, Timothy. Paul's second letter to his son is one to encourage him in the faith. Paul would encourage him to use his spiritual gifts and also to give him insight about the church. He would tell him how to deal with false teachers in the church and even warn him about perilous times that will come in the last days. Are we in the last days, church? Amen. Some scholars say Paul was writing this letter to Timothy because he knew his life was coming to an end. Here in this letter, we see it's here from a spiritual father to a son in the ministry. Now we will look into our text and explore a little bit and see how Paul would encourage his son in the gospel, Timothy. And now in 2021, how we can be encouraged, amen? As we look at the following three points. Point number one, faith needed. Faith needed. We definitely need some faith. Uh, point number two, faith steered. Faith stared. And our point number three is faith in Jesus. Amen. There's no other faith if there's no faith other than in Jesus. Amen. Well, let's look at our point number one. Faith needed. Let's look at our text, 2 Timothy 1, 
verses 1 and 2. And it reads, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to, his, to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 2 says, To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul, an apostle. This word, apostle, from the translation, apostolos, one who is sent forth. In the Holman's Bible Dictionary, I looked it up and it puts it this way. An apostle represents the one sending and has authority to represent the sender in business, in political or educational situations. Well, here are a few other references in the Bible where Paul begins here as an apostle to the will of God. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 1, it speaks about that. In 2 Corinthians 1 and 1, Ephesians 1 and 1, and there are many other scriptures talking about Paul the apostle, and I won't list them all. When you are sent as a representative of God, what you do is you must line up with his perfect will for your life. You must line up with the, the will of God for your life. I will always remind my man's class in Sunday school. The will of God is like a straight line, picture it. God spoke his will over our lives before we were even in our mother's womb. The will of God doesn't change, but yet we do. We always change. We must thank God for his mercy and for his grace when we find ourselves falling away from that straight line or the perfect will that he has for our lives. We oftentimes want to make our own lines, whether it be crooked or whether they be straight. And most of the times, they're far from straight. We praise God, he is always a prayer away. He can get us back on track through his son, Jesus Christ, a man who came back as a ransom, amen? Amen, because I knew I was once in darkness and he snatched me out of that sinful state. I just thank God because he can always bring us back. Yes, I, I was brought up in the church. I strayed away. But as the word says, you train up a child in the way that they should do. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. So when the will of God is on your life, you must line up with it. But it takes you to accept it. Amen. So here we see Paul knew this quite well, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Remember in John 14, 6. So we must have the same type of faith. In our text, 2 Timothy 1, verses 3 and 4, it reads, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Verse 4 says, greatly desirous to see thee, this is Paul speaking to his son, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. In study, I found out that all of Paul's letters, going from Romans all the way up to the book of Timothy, Paul always gave thanks. Paul finds himself in a mood of thanksgiving to God, in whom he will serve. This was something he had always done on many occasions. For here in our text, Paul writes his letter from a prison cell in a Roman dungeon, giving thanks to God. Can we give God thanks even when we find ourselves in our own prisons of life? It may be a physical prison. It may be an emotional prison. You find yourself in, you might question God. Can you always give God thanks in those situations? So here we see Paul here is serving God with a pure conscience, as his forefathers did. His forefathers, who were Jewish, they had done this. The blueprint had already been laid. So this was already in him. As I said, when you raise up a child young in the way, they should go. When they get old, they will not depart from it. Amen? So it was already in him. We can look right here in Bermuda. Back in the day, our great-grandfathers, 
our grandfathers. They served the true and living God. But here we are here today in 2020, a large percentage of our children will not be able to say this. They will not be able to say that they have the blueprint of this life of faith in Jesus. We are now living in a society who has turned their back on God. They don't, have, they don't want anything to do with God. They don't want anything to do with the church or what's happening here today. It happened in the Bible. So hey, it must happen in these last days, amen? Back in our text in verse four, where it said, I thank God who I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience, that with all season I remember, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Here the word written by Paul, had Timothy in his prayers night and day. He understood the gospel that he preached. His son in the gospel, Timothy, will also someday be persecuted, maybe even put in jail for it and condemned. In 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 5, Paul gives Timothy a charge to preach the gospel. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 says, preach the word, be in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Verse three says, for the time will come. <laughs> that time we find ourselves in here today, church. It says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. And verse four says, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And verse five says, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Church, we're gonna endure some of these afflictions that come our way. And it says, do the work of an evangelist. You have to get out into the world. Tell them about Jesus Christ, amen? And it says, to make full proof of thy ministry. With Paul having Timothy, his son of the gospel, in his prayers, I'm sure Paul had a spiritual insight into the things his son Timothy will come up against. The mere fact that Timothy was attached to Paul, the devil wasn't pleased, and he would step up his game and his attack on him in the future. My Shekinah family, because we are attached to our great pastor, who is a voice for our times, don't think the devil is happy. The mere fact that we are attached to Shekinah Worship Center and to our pastor, the devil wants to step up his attack. I praise God. That's why she prays for us. Amen. And it reminds me of that song, Somebody Prayed For Me. That old school song. Had me on their mind. Took the time to pray for me. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed for me. Somebody had a mother that prayed for them. Somebody had a father that prayed for them. Somebody had a grandfather, a grandma that prayed for them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Back to our text in verse four. And it reads, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Here we see in our text, Paul is mindful of the tears of his son in the gospel, Timothy, had shed previously when he had been put in prison the first time. So with Paul being locked up here a second time, he was desirous to see his son Timothy again. This would have to give him much joy just to see his face, to communicate with him, I'm sure. And in our text in verse five, it says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. What comes to mind when reading this was Timothy's unfeigned faith. When you're in prison, think about it, you have a lot of time on your hands. You're in prison sitting there, you have a lot of time on your hands. So he had time to think. Let's look at this word, this word unfeigned. 
Anukokritios, meaning <laughs> undisguised. All right, that's what that word means. And I looked it up in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, he gave a little commentary by Mr. Martinio. And he puts it this way. This word is designative of the moral quality of faith. The mark of transparency, remember that word. The mark of transparency. Have we heard that word in the last few years in our political world? Okay, and the, sim and the simplicity of soul, the most complete and distinct explanation of a man's character. The natural of pure and a good heart, a readiness to believe in goodness. That was his words. So this was the kind of faith that Paul had seen in his son, Timothy. This faith was dwelt first in his grandmother and then in his mother, Eunice. What a legacy, what a legacy. That reminds me of three generations, amen? Can we imagine in Bermuda, if we had a three generation tear like this, a three generation tear of faith in Jesus Christ, what a Bermuda it will be, amen? Faith is needed. Faith is needed definitely in this time. In these last days, faith is needed. The Holy Spirit reminded me that I can put myself even in this tax right here. The Holy Spirit reminded me, took me back to my grandfather, my grandfather, Deacon Charles Arthur Trott. Many of Bermuda knows him from the House of Prayer days. All right, right up on Pullen Hill. All right, my grandfather was a great man of faith. Okay, the uh, next generation was my father, Councilman C.H. Thornton Trott. That's his real name, but a lot of people knew him as Harry Trott, which is too Indian now. I love you, Dad. I want to give readings to you. All right, another great man of faith. He is one of the longest serving members of the New Testament Church of God in Bermuda. Many people don't know this, but he started very, very young in the faith. A man full of words, full of wisdom, depending on when you talk to him. <laughs> because he could, he could talk your own if it is ready, amen? That's my daddy and I love him, amen? And I honor him today. I, I honor him today. Amen, because he showed me what a go affair man should look like. All right, even when my mother passed, he showed me how to take care of his children. All right, it showed me a lot. We went to work second jobs to put my brother through college, to put my sister through college. I wasn't the brain guy, but I wanted to go to college. But I said, no, dad, I, my sister, my sister, she's... I know she wants to be a teacher. Um, don't worry about me, I'll, I'll be all right. So I thank God for the great man that he is. So that what three generations look like, amen? So our job is to impact one person at a time to leave a legacy of faith behind. We need to make sure we leave a legacy of faith behind when we leave this earth. We must keep the faith so we can hear these words. And this was part of Paul's last testament in 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, a very familiar scripture. It says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Verse 8 says, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. Amen. So there's a crown of life when we have that faith, when we have that legacy that we leave behind. There's a crown laid out for you. Amen. We can't waver. Faith is needed, especially in 2021. Now, we can see in the last days, as the word tells us, perilous times are here. We need faith, not faith in men but our faith shall be in God through Jesus Christ. We have to be transparent. Remember that word? We have to be transparent just as Paul was to his son, Timothy. He wasn't disguised. He wasn't hidden. He didn't, he didn't hide his faith. 
he went to prison because of what he stood on. Are you prepared to stand on the word of God? Are you, are you prepared to, to go to jail believing in your faith? That's, that's deep when you really think about it. But Paul was, amen? Our lights need to shine brighter, more so now in these days than ever before. So our lights can shine, that the people can see not us, but they can see the God in us, amen? And that moves me to our point, number two. Faith stirred. Faith stirred. In our text, 2 Timothy 1, verse 6, and it reads, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. This is Paul here speaking. Paul knowing the gift that God had put in his son Timothy. He had time to reflect. Remember, he was in prison. In this letter, he encouraged Timothy to stir up the gift that was given by God through the laying on of hands. Early in Timothy, in 1 Timothy 4, 14, it reads, he said, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by, the, by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. And God showed me a little demonstration. It will take a few seconds to to demonstrate, and if everybody can see. So I have a glass here, it has some drink mix. All right, so the drink mix in the bottom here represents our gift. God has given each and every one of us a gift and a talent. So the gift by itself here, sitting here, it's doing nothing. The purpose of the drink mix is to have something added to it. Amen? So maybe you want to add a little bit of water. So we will add, add the water to the drink mix. Okay, so you, now you see something has happened. The water, which represents the Holy Spirit. So I poured the water into the drink mix. I poured it on purpose. I hope somebody's getting this. I poured it on the purpose. All right, this, this drink mix is here to bless somebody. <laughs> All right, so it activated the gift. The gift by itself weren't doing anything. So now we have the gift that's been activated by the water, which is the Holy Ghost. So after activation, there now has to be some action. I have to stir up the gift. Action is stirring up the gift. Now I have that rare picnic drink out of Roger's lights, but it's not complete because if I want to, to make it taste great, I have to add a little bit of sugar, maybe a little bit of lemon, a little bit of gingerbread. I can't give all my secrets away because Alder Rogers lost my drink. I, I can't give away my, my, all my mix. But we have to add a little something to it. Each and every one of us have a little something within us to add to the purpose that God has given you. Amen. So I hope that demonstration helps somebody tonight. Your gift is here to bless others. It's not just for you. When your gift is stirred up, Others will be blessed by it. Not only will you be blessed, but your gift will make room. That's what the word of God says. Your gift will make room for you. I looked up this word in the dictionary. Oxford describes the word stare as the action of staring or a disturbance Woo. or excitement. Wasn't that excitement, a little excitement going on just now when you, you saw that? I was excited because when God showed it to me, I was excited. So in order to stir up the gift with him, we must first move on that gift. In order for me to move on that purpose, that drink mix, it had to take some action. I mean, the action part had to take place. Then we must cause a spiritual disturbance. Because remember, the enemy don't like, don't like you or me who believe in God. So it's going to be a spiritual disturbance to him. He doesn't like anything that looks like God. 
that there must be some spiritual disturbance to the enemy, amen? Then finally, we must be excited. We have to be excited about what God has done for you and the gift that he's given you. We have to be excited with this gift, amen? That gift that's within us. Once the gift is stirred up, then the ministry begins. And we can now line up with that perfect will. Remember that straight line we talked about? From the beginning of time, the will of God for your life. And Pastor, you was talking about stirring up those gifts in the kitchen. That's what I was talking about from Wednesday night. You was touching on my sermon. I was like, no, Pastor, get out of my sermon. <laughs> All right, so we have to stir up those gifts, amen? Whatever gift God has within you, you have to stir up that gift. Uh, let's get back to our test text, amen, in um, 2 Timothy 1, let's look at verse 7. It says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Here it says, God hath not, meaning God has not, given what's coming up next. God has not given the spirit. Yes, I said, fear is a spirit. God has not given us the spirit of fear. Fear to the Christian is the opposite of faith. Psalms 27, one reminds us that the Lord is the light of my salvation. In whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Remember the enemy of our soul, the devil, will always want the opposite for us than what God has for us. Instead of having faith, which is the currency of heaven, the devil wants us to fear. We must have faith because the Bible tells us without faith is what? An impossible to please him. So we must have faith. You can find that in Hebrews 11, 6. You can read that in your time. One of my favorite scriptures. This COVID-19 has so many Christians and non-believers living in fear. This pandemic has shaken up the world. But we know it's only a shadow of the things to come. Amen. As Christians, we shouldn't be shaken up with what's going on. The Bible is coming right to light, right before our presence eyes in 2021. We must not fear, but we must put our total trust in Jesus. Paul reminds Timothy that God has not given him the spirit of fear. Paul showed Timothy that God has given him three more things that supersedes the spirit of fear. There's three things were power, dunamis, mean ability. God gives us the ability to accomplish whatever he wills for your life. Number two, he gives love. Pastor touched on this this morning again, agape love, which is God's love of who he is. Yeah, first John 4 and 8. Remember what that tells us. And number three, the thing that he gives us is a solemn mind. He gives us the mind of Christ, a disciplined mind. You can find that in Philippians 2 and 5. God gives us the mind of Christ. God gives us everything we spiritually need. We must decide to move in faith and stir up those dormant gifts. Just as that mix was in that glass by itself, sitting there doing nothing. We must now activate that gift that's within. These gifts become part of our purpose. So we can fulfill the will or that straight line that God has for our lives. And that takes me now into my final point. Yes, I'm moving real quick. I hope you're all enjoying this. And our point three is faith in Jesus. We must have faith in Jesus. In our text, 2 Timothy 1, I'm going to read verse 8 and verse 9. It said, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. And verse 9 says, Who have saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus when? Before the world began. You want to know when you got it? That's when you got it. 
before the world began. That's when he gave it to you. Amen. He had you in mind way back when. Hallelujah. Paul tells Timothy here not to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. We cannot be shameful as Christians when talking about Jesus. Just remind me, just God had just showed me that. I was watching a, a preacher preach and pray and we didn't close our prayer in Jesus' name. I mean, if we believe in Jesus Christ, let's, let's, let's stand up for who we believe. Yes, I do a lot of prayers for my, my, my club, PHC. And when I pray, that's what I pray in. If, if you want me to pray or anybody asks me to pray outside of church, if I'm not praying in Jesus' name, you must find someone else. Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because I know what he's done for me. So when I pray, I will pray in Jesus' name. So we must not be ashamed to call his name in 2021. Amen? I hope someone got that. So Paul tells him not to be ashamed of his testimony. In Luke 9, 26, Jesus tells his disciples, for whoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the son of man be ashamed. And he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. Jesus reminds us that if we are ashamed of him, there is coming a day he will be ashamed of you. Wow, that's powerful. Before his father, which is in heaven. Paul also tells Timothy not to be ashamed of him. Him as a prisoner in bars or a prisoner of God. He encourages Timothy to be a partaker of the afflictions that he will go through for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you're probably thinking now, Deacon Stephen, are you asking me that we're going to go through some stuff? That I'm going to be partaking of all that stuff that people go against Christians? Uh, well, my response will be three letters. Why yes. Yes, the Bible tells us through that we must suffer persecution. We will be tested. We will be tried. People will say, say all manner of things against you. Why you ask? Just because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Because he went through it. Because if Jesus went through it, you are going to go through it. Amen? So remember, what we had said earlier, God has not given us that spirit of fear. So there's no need to worry, even during this time of pandemic. No need to panic. God's got you. Even when you're going through your affliction, whatever it might be, you're going through your time of struggle. God's got you. There is no testimony without the test. You've heard it before. You cannot have a testimony without going through the test. Amen? So you're going to go through some stuff. You're going to go through some stuff. You must have faith in Jesus. Amen? Look at our text. Verse 9 says, He has saved us and called us for holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given in Jesus Christ. Before what? The world began. So in our text, the Bible tells us that God has saved us and called us before holy calling. He hasn't saved and called us according to our own works. As a lot of people think. It's because what I've done or where I've become. No. It says according to his own purpose. That's why he's called you. The Bible tells us that his purpose was given by Jesus before the world began. You are not just here on this earth to take up space. You're not here by a mistake or circumstance. Someone might have told you you're a mistake by your mother and your father. That is a lie from the pit of hell. You have purpose. Why? Because before the world began, God spoke purpose into your life. 
So you're not a mistake. As long as you have the breath of life blowing into you, purpose still exists. Your purpose was already established before time began. Take a second just to think about that. Before time was even spoken or God already had you in his mind. That was really deep and I had to think about that and just meditate on that. As we wind on on this word, just want to share a few things. Some of you might be watching or listening to this message. You may feel locked up. You may feel that someone's got you locked up and threw away the key, forgot all about you. I'm here to tell you that you have purpose. God hasn't given up on you. Maybe you've tried everything else and everything's failed. Well, I'm here tonight to present Jesus to you. As I said, faith is needed. There is no faith outside of Jesus. Because as I said, it's his will for your life. Well, the first step you must do is ask Jesus to come into your life. If you don't know him, you must ask him to forgive your sins. and Believe that Jesus died on a cruel cross for you. And one day he will come back as he sits on the right hand of God the Father, we're at this time making intercession for us. Maybe you once knew Jesus. Maybe you made that step one time before. And after you're hearing tonight, something ignited your spirit or something I said, wants you to get back to that place where you first believed. Tonight is your night. Reminding me of a song where it says, we fold on, but we get up. We fold on, but we get up. A saint is only just a sinner who fell down, but got up again. Don't stay down. Don't stay down in your mess. Don't stay locked up in your prison. But the Bible said, who the sun sets free is free indeed. Jesus can put you back together again. There's broken pieces, there's broken pot. Jesus could create a brand new thing. He says, I will do a new thing in you. Whatever you ask for, nothing shall be denied. We just have to ask. And maybe you just need someone to pray for you. Jesus is just a prayer away. It's not that far away. He has people here at Shekinah. He has a pastor here. He has members here at Shekinah that will pray for you. So that's my message tonight, even as I am. I just thank you even for tuning in. I know it's Super Bowl Sunday. And when I saw the date, I was like, oh, man, Super Bowl? All right. But let me let you know, there's a greater reward than the Super Bowl trophy. Hallelujah. That the reward that he has for you, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And where I am, there you may be also. In my father's house, there are many mansions. So I know he has a mansion for me. The streets are paved with gold. And as if we took the revelation class and we, we were enlightened about what it looks like. There's all oh, those different types of colors. Wow. That place is for you. How was it designed for you? It was designed for Satan and all those who will follow him and all his angels. He said, I came to give you life and I came to give you life more abundantly. He does not have just abundant life when we get to heaven. While we're here on earth, he's ready to give you that abundant life. And I thank God for the many blessings that he, he blessed me with. More abundantly. When I, when I thought and think I have nothing, he shows me that he has more. People ask me, how you do it? I said, I just say Jesus. That's all I say. Because if I thought about it, it don't add up. The bills and the check and it don't add up. Having a house and a mortgage and it don't add up. Trust me. But Jesus is in control. And I know that's a part of my testimony that I can share with others. We're going is Jehovah Jireh the provider? 
where we think we have less or nothing. He says, I have more for you. So I just thank you again for your time. I want to remind you, don't be scared, be stirred. Blessings. <laughs>